Number 10, Exceptional. Bailey Hoskins is known for being the worst X-Men ever, probably because his powers are pretty lackluster sounding, but manage to pack a pretty big bang when they do get used. Bailey's powers involve self-detonation, but the only thing is that activating his powers will actually also result in his death, meaning he can only use them once and doing so will kill him. However, he does end up doing this and in doing so saves the world, or at least a world. His good friend and teammate Miranda has reality warping powers that are extremely powerful, propelling her into her own classification of mutant even, in terms of power level. But even then, this time around, it seems Miranda can't seem to interfere in this world at this time. It seems she needs some help from Bailey, and in sacrificing himself, he not only saves the world, but also seemingly helps Miranda to fix it and set it right again or potentially erase it. That's kind of what it looks like happens at the end. But maybe that's how you fix it. Just wipe it. Number nine, Funny Man. Funny Man is an odd superhero who is historically actually pretty significant, despite how weird he may seem. He's not just powerful for how much of a goofball he is, he is powerful in a historical context, which I think means he deserves this spot. Also, I'm not sure if we've ever mentioned him on the channel, as far as I can recall, I haven't at the very least. Funny Man was a creation of Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster after they both left DC and began what would become an epic and longtime legal dispute over the rights to Superman, not feeling they were being fairly paid their dues. And for those who don't know, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster are the ones that created Superman. Siegel especially was passionate about getting the rights to their character back. After leaving DC, they reconnected with former DC editor Vin Sullivan, who had started up his own comic book company, Magazine Enterprises. Jerry and Joe tried to create the magic of Superman again, but this time by teaming up to make something entirely different and new, Funny Man. Celebrating their love of comic book pranks and humor, Funny Man was comedian Larry Davis, who after a publicity stunt gone wrong, ends up actually catching a real life criminal, and decides to become a bona fide superhero, using his jokes and funny pranks to apprehend and stop criminals. A wacky idea that sadly did not end up panning out in the end for Jerry and Joe, as the character only lasted six issues. Funny Man didn't have any powers, but he was miraculously and comically good at stopping villains with his antics, and sometimes even doing this completely by accident. Number 10. Phage. Phage first appeared in Venom Lethal Protector number 4, which was a six issue miniseries from 1993, but he wasn't named until 2012 in Carnage USA number 2. Phage is one of five symbiotes forcefully bred out of Venom. The siblings are Agony, Riot, Lasher, and Scream. The Phage would later combine with three of its siblings, Riot, Lasher, and Agony, to form the better known Hybrid symbiote. So from then on, we're dealing with hybrid and hybrids bondings. This all came about because of the success of the first Venom offspring, Carnage, and while people always want to repeat success. However, few of the symbiote offshoots have proved as popular or long-lasting as Carnage. Carnage first debuted in The Amazing Spider-Man number 361 in 1992. That was as a full appearance. Like Venom before him, he had had a cameo appearance the issue prior. And also like Venom before him, his host, Cletus Cassidy, had been pre-established. All factors on top of his design and absolute bloodlust that made him much more memorable of a character than Phage to most. Still, Marvel has been riding the more and more symbiotes ride ever since. And just look at what they've got Kate's doing with absolute carnage. Number 8. Dead Girl I think one of the weirdest things about Dead Girl is that her whole thing is immortality, as she's already dead and basically can't die, with her mutant powers activating only after her death. And yet she did die in the comics, possibly due to a disease which ultimately caused her to fall apart from decomposition. That is the one thing she's meant to be good at, not dying, and yet it happened. Because she's technically already dead. Fortunately, that didn't stop Dead Girl from going on adventures, and she currently still is dead doing so, even despite dying. Joining the newly reformed Static X as they battle against Zeitgeist team, excellent. Dead Girl's power allows her to reanimate herself, parts of herself, and to communicate with ghosts and even temporarily resurrect the dead. Number 7. Hand Suckers On the hands. If you thought the plasma thing was weird, it only really gets weirder when it comes to Morbius in the Spider-Man animated series. In the animated series, Morbius not only needed plasma instead of just straight up blood to live, but he also had fangs that basically went unused. I know what you're thinking, but wait a minute, Amanda, hold up! Don't vampires feed on their victims using their fangs? Yes, in folklore, they're either actually using their fangs to rend the flesh of their victims so they can basically feast on their blood, or in some cases, they actually even feed through their fangs 
using their especially long and pointed incisors like we would a straw. And in some cases, fangs have sort of like venom in them that sort of subdues their victim, depending on, you know, which type of vampire we're talking about from lore. However, in the animated series, while Morbius does have fangs, he doesn't really use them to feast. In that respect, they are more there for visual clarity and effect. Instead, Morbius has tentacle-like suckers on his hands, which is how he feeds. Weird? You betcha. Number six, Elasti Woman. Elasti Woman. Oh, I love Rita Farr. She is one of the members of DC's Doom Patrol. In the show Doom Patrol, Rita might struggle to utilize and control her powers, still afraid of them and of her appearance while using them, as well as becoming, you know, permanently stuck in her kind of creepy elastic form that she has in the show. But in the comics, Elasti Woman has learned to master her abilities. Rita gained her powers while she, as a Hollywood actress, was working on a set in Africa. She was exposed to volcanic gas, which allowed her to change the size of her body and limbs at will, also having the ability to stretch her limbs. John Byrne's interpretation of the character was also able to alter the size of objects just by touching them. And the current Prime Earth continuity version of her also has shape-shifting abilities. I also feel like DC's Doom Patrol series does a great job of capturing what like shape-shifting or stretching powers would be like in real life, and kind of the whole horror and body dysmorphia aspects of them. Possibly it's one of the best live action interpretations of this kind of power set I have ever seen. Also, if you aren't watching DC's Doom Patrol, what are you doing with your life? Go watch it, it's so good. At number five is Doorman. Okay, this is another one like Grasshopper that I genuinely think could have a chance at making an appearance in the MCU. Aside from his god-awful name and reputation as a pretty ridiculous hero, I think his power set and aesthetic are pretty dang cool. And no, he isn't super good at holding the door for people. He's actually got the ability to create portals as well as making himself totally intangible. And that pairing of powers actually matches up to being a pretty powerful combination. And tied in with his cool black and white color scheme, I honestly think that this guy can make an appearance in the MCU outside of a meme-like context. In the comics, he sacrifices himself to take down Maelstrom, but is revived as the Angel of Death, at which point he gets a major power boost. So perhaps this iteration as the Angel of Death could make an appearance hinting at the backstory of having been doorman in a previous life. Number four, Crazy Jane. Crazy Jane is a member of the Doom Patrol, and honestly, that is a great team to look at if you wanna find some superheroes who are actually quite powerful, but also just wonderfully weird. Jane is no exception to that rule. She's kind of like Marvel's Legion, who appeared only a few years before she made her debut over at DC Comics, first appearing in Doom Patrol issue 19 of the 1987 series, created by comic book writing legend Grant Morrison, and masterful artist Richard Case. Crazy Jane is Kay Chalice, who within her has at least 64 personalities, each with their own personas and their own power sets. While this means she has a lot of power at her fingertips, the challenging thing is that Jane often struggles to find balance with the various personalities residing within her, and has demonstrated various levels of control over them. And they over her. Number three, Vision loves Scarlet Witch because of Ultron? This is a weird theory that some people have in relation to Wanda and Ultron in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The belief here is that Vision, who was made by Ultron, loves Wanda, not necessarily because of his own feelings developing for her, although this does make a lot of sense just because, you know, his character development and that is what happens in the story, but because Ultron himself perhaps had feelings for Wanda. And as crazy as this theory sounds, and perhaps non-foundational, as it sounds in relation to what goes on in those movies, the reality is it could be true, and here is why. In the Ultimate Universe, which serves to inspire much that we see in the MCU, Ultron is in love with Wanda, and it isn't any hidden love either. It's laid out in plain sight. Even weirder, obviously, is that Wanda isn't interested, as she's with her brother at the time, and Wanda's spurning of Ultron is what also apparently helps to turn him into a killer robot. Yeah. It's very different, very fresh. Number two, Metamorpho. Probably one of the strangest, but also most powerful heroes out there is Metamorpho. Metamorpho made his first appearance back in 1965 in the Brave and the Bold issue 57, and has also been known as the Element Man in comics. He is a very unique and interesting power set that allows him to transform his body or parts of his body into any element. This also gives him a pretty unique look as well. Metamorpho isn't the only hero to exhibit these powers, 
hours though. At one point we also had Element Girl, whose story ended up turning quite bleak in the end, I must say. She assisted Metamorpho on some of his adventures, and maybe if we do a part two, I will tell you some more about her on that list. Number one, Dupe. By far the strangest, yet kinda in a weird way most OP characters of all time from Marvel, has to be Dupe. Okay, so he's at the very least the most strange, even if you don't agree that he's the most OP. And now we have his evil counterpart, Pood in Excellent. Oh boy. Dupe is pretty powerful because he has some fourth wall shattering level of awareness and is able to actually move between panels in comics, existing not just within the pages panels, but also moving into the borders and margins of that page as well, which I think is pretty wild. He's also demonstrated some powerful magical abilities as well as super strength, speed, durability, and even the power to resurrect without the help of the five, no less. Yeah, because Dupe is also like associated with mutants, even though I don't really know if we've clarified if Dupe is actually a mutant, but he's definitely mutant adjacent at least. At number 10, we have Hindsight Lad. Okay, there are gonna be some joke characters on here, but I'm not messing around when I say that some of these extra weird ones would actually do well in the MCU, at least for a moment. For example, Hindsight Lad, although he's very silly and probably not meant to be more than a gag character in the comics, I think would be a very funny throwaway joke for the bigger Marvel fans. In the comics, Hindsight Lad is actually just computer programmer Carlton LaFroige who tries to pass off the ability of learning from the past as a superpower to make it onto the new Warriors team. What's even dumber than the name is that he actually makes it onto the team and quickly becomes the least liked member. But I don't see the MCU taking the joke that far, but I could see a non-superpowered supporting character taking on the goofy mantle for a one-off joke. At number nine, we have Dupe. As silly as this character seems, he's not much more bizarre than Rocket Raccoon and that character has proven to have made a seamless transition into the MCU since his debut in 2014. Okay, Dupe is a little sillier. He's an alien creature who looks like a green bean with arms and a face, but he has a huge range of powers and an actually pretty impressive strength level, giving him enough to hold up in a battle with Thor. He can shoot psionic energy and also use, get this, bass guitar to channel the power of the funk. He also uses a gun called the Ultimate Nullifier, which shoots bees, chainsaws, and bowling balls out of it. He's probably the weirdest character on this list in all respects, but maybe he would be a fun cameo in a battle set in space in an upcoming movie, or maybe just somewhere in the background for a second. Once again, I really think this character should only exist as a fun moment and not by any means be featured in any front running role. I don't wanna watch the MCU destroy their legacy any more than the next guy. At number eight, we have Phone Ranger. Okay, it's getting hard to keep up this charade that I actually want these characters woven into the MCU in any major way. I think it's fair to say that any of these heroes so far would be funny to see briefly just for the meme of it, but I don't wanna pretend I'd actually want a Phone Ranger series or even a scene with him any longer than two minutes because this hero is literally a phone repairman with a mini spaceship after an average phone repairman named A.G. Bell discovers a tiny ship trapped in one of the phones he's repairing Pairing, he gains access to every communication system in the world. This isn't the most compelling power set or origin story, but I don't know, maybe we could even just see an homage to this weird superhero when Ant-Man flies a tiny ship out of a telephone speaker or something, I don't know. Number seven, Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur make for a great pair, especially as Moon Girl's power set allows her to swap her consciousness with Devil Dinosaur's consciousness. An oddly specific but super powerful ability. Moon Girl, aka Lunella Lafayette, actually has inhuman lineage and gained her abilities after undergoing terogenesis. Aside from that, she is also a super genius and despite her young age, is likely one of the most brilliant and gifted minds that we have in the Marvel Universe. Also, when we're talking about weird power sets and weird heroes who are also super powerful, Moon Girl really fits the bill, as even outside of being a superhero, she's identified as a kind of oddball her entire life. In fact, she was super nervous about undergoing terogenesis because of this. Although she has embraced her weirdness, she was worried that this would just be another thing that would make her stand out more and turn her into even more of a freak than she already was. Aw, Lunella. 
I identify a lot with Moon Girl. I feel like she's such a cool and underrated character. At number six, we have Glob Herman. With hints at mutants appearing in phase five of the MCU, we may be able to see some X-Men in the MCU pretty soon. Now, I don't think they'll be rushing to get Glob Herman on the big screen before Wolverine or Magneto, let's say, but there's a chance that if they really dive into the X-Men storylines and characters, we can expect to see a whole slew of new characters and maybe, maybe Glob Herman will make a cameo. Glob has a thick layer of wax instead of skin, which is transparent and allows you to see his skeleton and organs moving around in there. But he isn't entirely useless and is actually known to be relatively important as a character in the comics. He can light himself on fire and fling hot flaming wax at his enemies, which isn't an awful power set, but it's also pretty bad. Number five, mutants no more. What would a weirdest things list for Marvel be without me mentioning my extreme dislike of Brotherhood of Evil Mutants originating members Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver being retconned as non-mutants. This all went down in Axis where it was revealed via a retcon that Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver had never truly been mutants or Magneto's children, but were basically tricked into thinking so based on the High Evolutionary experimenting on them when they were young. Once the High Evolutionary was done with them, he discarded them, disguising them genetically as mutants. Wanda found out about this when she attempted to put a blood curse on her relatives, only to discover that it worked on Pietro, but not on Eric. So yes, Eric is not the father, but he still basically was with them the whole time and then was like, by the way, I'm your dad, and now he's not. I think we can still count it, even though they're not blood related, but they should be blood related. It hurts my brain. At number four is Squirrel Girl. Probably the most competent member of the Great Lakes Avengers, Squirrel Girl actually has a decent chance to appear in some iteration in a future MCU project. At first glance, she seems like a pretty silly character sporting a big furry squirrel tail and ears, but she actually has a pretty decent power set on top of it, including super strength night vision, a healing factor, and superhuman leaping. She's also adept with computers and communications. So even if we don't see her on the battlefield, it's possible she appears in the control room of some shield operation at some point. I don't know, Squirrel Girl is a cult favorite. And out of all the weird characters on this list, she's probably one of the most respected out of all of them. Number three, Squirrel Girl. Squirrel Girl is also one of the most ridiculous heroes when it comes to her premise and her power set. Although really what makes Squirrel Girl, aka a Doreen Green so strong of a hero, so powerful of a hero, and of a character, is her likability and her approach to heroism. She has a tendency to beat villains by befriending them and persuading them to stop their devilish and deadly plots. Although she has also summoned an army of squirrels in the past to help her take down even some of the most famous and notorious villains, like early on in her career when she handily and embarrassingly defeated Doctor Doom. Squirrel Girl has also faced off and defeated the likes of Thanos and Galactus as well. I love Doreen Green. I want to be Doreen Green. She's so great. At number two, we have Marrow. A former member of the X-Men, Marrow is another example of a sort of weird character that we can imagine being featured in one way or another in an upcoming MCU project. Definitely not in this phase, since they haven't yet included X-Men in their rollouts as of yet, but maybe in phase five, they'll dig deep and feature some more niche X-Men like Marrow. Her powers are basically that she can grow her bones on command. Well, at first it isn't on command really. She is actually known at first to have very little control of her powers, leaving her overtaken by the extreme growth of bone matter from within her body, which is sort of gross and terrifying, but perhaps that could be used in a cool way for the MCU. Maybe Mero is facing challenges controlling her powers throughout one of the movies, and only when Professor X helps her hone them does she come through as a deus ex machina at the end of one of the movies. I don't know, something like that. She's not even that weird, honestly. I just genuinely think I'd like to see her in an MCU project. At number one, we have the one and only my all-time favorite, favorite 3D Man. If you've watched my other weird heroes lists, you'll know by now that I'm a huge fan of 3D Man. Is that ironic? Is it a serious claim? You can't tell. Well, honestly, it's a bit of both. Primarily, I just love the idea of a hero that's 3D themed with absolutely no relationship to anything 3D whatsoever. Something about the character being stuck in the early 2000s when 3D had hit another golden age, sporting a green and red suit and the whole thing. Something about that just makes me laugh. So that's the ironic side. But honestly, I think this character could be explored further. Delroy Garrett Jr. grew up as a track and field star, competing in the Olympics and the whole nine yards, no pun intended. But 
I feel like there hasn't been a hero that's before anything else, an athlete. Unless you count Spider Girl. I guess Spider Girl was an athlete in school, but she hasn't been in the MCU. But I just feel like this could be a cool opportunity for Marvel to offer more representation to the athletics community. That and how 3D Man's whole vibe is lost in time and it would be so cool and maybe a bit refreshing to revisit that retro early 2000s era at some point on the big. Number 10, Baby Inheritors. We've gone into the Spider-Verse multiple times in the comics now and we are about to go back again, supposedly one last time, we'll see what happens. But I'm sure nothing can top the weirdness of how the last Spider-Man multiversal crossover ended. In the first Spider-Verse in the comics, the Inheritors were the group of villains that the spider totems of the multiverse had to band together to fight. At the end of that event, they defeated them, but then oddly enough, they returned again via Superior Spider-Man, aka Otto Octavius' tech. The Inheritors managed to clone themselves and make a comeback in Spider-Geddon, once more uniting the spider army to come together and defeat their threat to the multiverse. The inheritors are basically energy vampires who specifically prey on animal or insect inspired totemic beings, like spider totems. Spider totems are basically people across the multiverse with spider like powers and abilities who were destined to become spider themed heroes and protect their world. At the end of Spider Geddon, the inheritors are defeated by being turned into baby versions of themselves and given to Spider Man, Aunt May of Earth 3123, to raise to be good. Because that's how you defeat villains sometimes. Sometimes you just gotta raise them yourself. Number 9, Feed Me Plasma. One of the weirdest things, especially here on the internet, is everyone's obsession with Morbius feeding on plasma and not human blood. I mean, the amount of times I've talked about Morbius drinking blood and people on the internet have been like, actually, it's plasma. It's an insane amount. <laughs> people really love the plasma. This doesn't actually come from the comics, though, but instead is something that grew out of the Spider Man animated series. And it came to be thanks to. Censorship, of course, like with so many weird things that we have, because isn't that just always the way? Morbius being a vampire on basically a children's animated series wasn't allowed to be shown feeding on blood because it was considered too violent. So instead, they had Morbius thirst for plasma. That way you can uh, get around the whole blood thing. Although plasma, of course, it's in blood. Plasma is the liquid portion of your blood that contains mainly water as opposed to the other portions of your blood, which is primarily made up of red and white blood cells as well as platelets. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list here, and you are loving what we do on the channel, please head on over to Facebook. You can follow us there, and we have more exciting content coming your way and some exclusive things planned for you in the future, we hope. Number eight, Fin Fang Foom's diaper. Speaking of censorship, I have another strange one for you. This one comes from the comics, and we have the Comics Code Authority to thank for it, of course. Thanks, CCA, thank you so much. Fin Fang Foom is a dragon that is well known in the comics. Recently in the MCU, we actually thought Fin Fang Foom might appear in Shang-Chi based on merch, only to learn that the dragon there was actually instead known as the Great Protector, so that, that was not Fin Fang Foom. In the comics, I recently saw Fin Fang Foom in the pages of Marauders, where he pops up before the original team dissolved, with Iceman actually fighting Foom before deciding to take a vacation from his work on the team, eventually leaving the Marauders completely once they rebooted that series. Well, I mean, at least he's gone for now. Bobby might be back later, but for now, He's out. Fin Fang Foom has years of history and a good chunk of those years he spent in a purple diaper. Why? Because the CCA was worried about the dragon's indecent exposure. I'm not joking here, guys. That's that's what they were like. They're like, he's gotta wear pants. He's up there, he's naked. And it is for the reason of dragon modesty that he was forced to wear his iconic purple diaper or boxers or shorts, depending on, of course, who's drawing him and, you know, how you, as the person reading and looking at the comic, want to interpret that garment that he was forced into wearing. At number seven, we have Grasshopper. This guy is known as a bit of a loser in the comics, having been killed off a handful of times in pretty embarrassing ways. But despite this, and despite the fact that he's based on a much less cool insect than Spider Man, I think he has some potential. Even if he's kept as a sort of B character, I think he could fit into the MCU in some weird way. I think his costume isn't badly designed, and well, that's kind of it. I think he could do for a modernization upgrade, but maybe one of the Marvel heroes out of touch parents could take on the mantle for a bit, or an annoying older brother or something like that. He only joins the Great Lakes Avengers in the comics, so maybe in the future, an MCU version of the Young Avengers could come across the GLA and we can catch a glimpse of Grasshopper. And finally, in at number one, Rainbow Girl. 
Ending off our list with an inherently sexist creation, we have Rambo Girl. Rambo Girl is an extraterrestrial character who first appeared in 1963 in DC's Adventure Comics issue 309. She is a metahuman who wields the power of the mysterious emotional spectrum, resulting in unpredictable mood swings. You can't make this sh up. It's like my mantra for this whole series. She would tap into colors that would result in different moods. Red being anger, blue being hope, green being willpower. She once also exhibited the ability to create a pheromone field that surrounded her in a giant rainbow and gave her an irresistible personality. Ugh. But here's where it gets utterly fascinating. Even DC doesn't know what the hell she can do. According to Jeff Johns, during the Blackest Night event, he noted that Rainbow Girl doesn't fully understand her powers and uses them more for fun. Just, just kill me now. Number 6 Clone Saga Some people love it, some people hate it, but if you had to collect it or organize it into a trade, all of us were likely confused by it. Even to this day, the Clone Saga remains a hard story to follow because it spanned so many different Spider-Man comics, and because… We had so many Spider-Man comics! The Clone Saga is a story where Spider-Man ends up being cloned by his nemesis, the Jackal, and then upon meeting his clones begins to question if he is actually the original Peter Parker or merely a clone himself. A lot of people are not fans of the Clone Saga because of the story's twist at the end, which many felt made the emotional investment that they had put in during the crossover story feel worthless in the end. Number 5. Multiple Man Multiple Man has a strange and yet awesome power. He can create duplicates, often referred to as dupes, for short, of himself, and use them to do and learn all sorts of things. Why learn? Well, because when he absorbs these duplicates back into himself, he also gains all their memories and knowledge. As long as he gets to absorb them back, that is. We've seen a lot of weird stories with Multiple Man because of this part of his unique power set, including one where he had a baby with his girlfriend Siren, but because he had actually sent a dupe to sleep with her on the night the child was conceived, when he first went to hold their newborn child because it was actually a product of a dupe, it got absorbed back into him. Lots of weird things about that, well, that whole scenario. And then there was the time that he secretly sent a dupe posing as him, I mean technically they're all him, but you know, they're not the real him, to hang out with Layla and their son together, Davy, when Davy took his first steps. This dupe tragically died during an attack on Madrox's lab in X Corp, so he wasn't able to actually absorb him back, and therefore lost those memories forever. Ooh, sad, weird. Kinda awful, Jamie. I love when people are always like, man, Jamie, why are you always sending dupes to hang out with me? And Jamie's response is just like, I mean, technically the dupes are me, so like, you're just hanging out with me. Number 4. Ultimate Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver One of the weirdest things that we've seen to this day comes from the recesses of the Marvel Multiverse. Because... Of course it does. The Ultimate Universe is the universe of Earth 1610, which was created to be its own world and separate line from the main continuity, focused on making Marvel Comics more accessible to new fans while offering established fans a fresh take on their favorite characters, many of which were either more grounded or gritty or some combination of those two. In the case of Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, I definitely say we got something unique, but not in a good way. While Wanda and her brother Pietro have always been close in the 616 continuity, 1610 took this to another level, with the two siblings having an implied romantic relationship. Yeah, not necessarily what we expected or wanted from a fresh take on these characters. At number 3 we have Howard the Duck. We all know that back in 2014, Marvel gifted viewers with one of the best memes of the year with a fake post credit sequence suggesting that there be a Howard movie coming out in the MCU. Of course, this was just a poke at how silly the idea would be and I agree. I just think that now, with all the fan service that has been done over the last few years, it's possible that we get to see this little dude again at some point. All joking aside, Side though, Howard the Duck has appeared in so many Marvel events in the comics at one point or another that his wiki is actually up there with one of the longer reads out of any hero I've read. From the Fear Itself storyline to Original Sin, Marvel Comics often takes any interdimensional event as an excuse to bring back Howard for a laugh. So why wouldn't they continue to do so in the MCU? I bet the Guardians of the Galaxy post credit scene wasn't the last we'll see of this very serious detective. And the 1986 feature film with a 
14% on Rotten Tomatoes does not count. Number 2. Ruins The multiverse is full of disturbing realities, but none so disturbing, I don't think, as Ruins. Marvel's Ruins was created by Warren Ellis, with beautifully haunting artwork by Therese and Cliff Nielsen and Chris Moeller. The story that allows us to see into this world is only two issues in length, and yet based on the content in here, it does feel much longer. This is because Marvel Ruins is a parody of the Marvel Universe, where Ellis imagines what the heroes and villains would be like in the real world. It's bleak and disturbing, with many superpowers being practically explored in a way that turns them into more of a curse than a blessing. Number 1. Sins Past Maybe one of the weirdest things in all of the cosmos and across multiple realities actually comes from the main reality of Earth 616. This awful thing has since been retconned away, but it still happened and you can still go back and read it and likely be traumatized by reading it upon doing so. That's right, we are talking about Sins Past. In this story, Gwen Stacy and Norman Osborn were given added history. Doesn't sound so bad, yeah? Until you learn that this added history involved them being in a relationship together? A secret relationship where Norman got Gwen pregnant and was her first intimate lover. And as a result of their affair, they had two twin children who grew up to become goblins themselves. That's all I got. I that's, that's it, man. I'm just gonna throw my hands up to that, because that's insane. Initially, of their children, Gabriel was known as Grey Goblin, and later on, both Sarah and Gabriel will disguise themselves as the villain known as Kindred, which happened more recently in the comics. Don't worry, though. We later learned that these two were actually just unstable clones, as opposed to being the true, naturally born children of Gwen and Norman and their love affair. Number 9. Ruin Venom. Runes, depends how you want to say it. This symbiote comes to us from Ruin vs. Venom number 1 in 1995, and has direct connection to Planet of the Symbiotes, which was a five issue event from 1995, and actually had to do with the fallout over the creation of the five forcefully bred symbiotes we just talked about. Also, the planet in question is Earth, don't get excited. Ruins is a murder mystery, which I'm about to semi well ruin, so heads up. Ruin Venom involves a symbiote that survived the seeming death of all invading symbiotes from the planet arc and bonds to Ruin. So who is Ruin? Well, Ruin was an extreme vampire-like creature created in the 90s who debuted in Sludge Number 1. He begins framing Venom for murders around town by writing Venom in huge letters next to the victim. Copy and carnage much? Of course the media falls for it. However, Ruin Venom runs into some problems, not only when real Venom comes to investigate, but also when Ruin begins to suspect some of his actions are being influenced. Ruin. Number 8. Kuroba Kuroba first debuted in Venom Seed of Darkness number 1 in 1997. Are you picking up on just how much Venom stuff was going on in the 90s? There was no escape. If you didn't like Venom, godspeed. Side note, Kuroba's heading on the cover is The Living Darkness, and inside the book, he's called The Abyss That Walked. Pretty neat. So this is supposed to be a story that occurs before the current timeline, well the then current timeline. Marvel will do this sometimes when they have a tale that really won't slot anywhere but isn't strong enough for a what if, or they're going through a period where they're not publishing what ifs. It's a pretty simple story. Krova bonds with a scientist, Dr. Don Levy. It tells him that it will help maintain knowledge, you know the usual, but it tricks him. It's up to Eddie Brock to defeat him. I'm kidding, Eddie isn't Venom. In this story, he's still a not as good as Peter Parker photographer, so he observes and ponders on the nature of man and monster. This one is less hard to understand and more easy to miss. And at 7, Jazz. If you thought Thunderer was a character who had a silly power, get ready to wrap your mind around Jazz. No, not the music but the character. Jazz, whose real name is John Xander, is a blue-skinned mutant who wanted to be a rapper, but was not good at it. He became a drug runner instead, selling toad juice, which was a drug made from the secretions of another mutant. Gross. After M-Day, he was one of the few who retained his powers, and later, while trying to buy drugs, he was killed by Johnny D via a miniature voodoo doll. Needless to say, dude has a bit of a mockable storyline. So why is he confusing? Because he is a low level mutant who doesn't actually have an ability. His mutation is that his skin is blue. That's it. I mean, maybe he could rap you to death with his mediocrity, but Technically, that is not a superpower. That's just a depressing character trait. Number 6. Mania Mania first debuted in Venom number 1 in 2003. This symbiote is a clone of Venom, which given Marvel's history with dragging out perfectly good clone sagas until the entire creative staff behind them is permanently traumatized, I'm amazed a direct clone like this hadn't happened sooner. Also, it was only named Mania in 2011, when Venom relaunched. So this clone was created using a piece of Venom's tongue, which is hardly surprising. That tongue is 
everywhere. From the start, the symbiote was sadistic, refusing to bond with awkward hosts, instead torturing and killing them, sometimes by pulling up the worst fears from their memories and then acting on those. The thing with mania is that it's hard to track, because a bunch of things that happen, such as it being reabsorbed into Eddie's symbiote, such as it being reabsorbed into Eddie's symbiote, are no longer considered canon. Now, mania is just kind of around and brought out when necessary, but since Kate's and the ridiculous amount of symbiotes he's been creating, we'll see how some of these other symbiotes fare. Number five, Identity Crisis. Identity Crisis is one of those stories that was really well received when it was released, but people now look back on it with a bit of a jaded eye. Identity Crisis was released from June to December of 2004 and was written by famed thriller novelist Brad Meltzer, who wanted to create a thriller in the superhero format. The ramifications it had on characters and some of the mischaracterizations are still discussed to this day. But paradoxically, it was very solidly written. It just really needs to be taken on its own in a bubble, which thanks to two universe-wide shifts since, one can now do. So the villainess of this tale was Jean Loring, the former wife of the Atom, Ray Palmer, who set about terrorizing the loved ones of heroes so that she and the Atom would get back together because he'd be concerned about her safety. The only thing is right out the gate, she accidentally killed the elongated man's wife, and then it was just a case of escalation. Escalation. Let me kill my friends so that my ex will get back with me. Or, you know, I could call him. This is why she ended up in Arkham, which was also a terrible idea. She knew identities, but Ray put her there anyway. Maybe they truly were meant to be. Number four, Magic Venom. Getting real recent now. Magic Venom debuted in Venom Volume 4, number 13 in 2019, and has ties to the War of the Realms event. The one that people on the outside like to make fun of because the lead villain is Malekith, the dark elf from Thor to the Dark World. Well, he was from elsewhere first, but that's where many know him from now. And there's been this odd campaign to make Thor 2 relevant again. It's been very interesting. War of the Realms actually starts with him already having conquered all the other realms. So you're stuck in the lamest one, this one, Midgard, Earth. Again, I live here. Give me Alfheim or Valheim, somewhere else. Anyways, everyone has to band together and stop him. In this arc, Eddie and Venom are separated, so he is given a dream stone by a dark elf who is hoping to recruit him. The dream stone acts as an artificial symbiote, but is a mindless one, and Eddie ultimately uses pieces of the suit to save civilians. And at three, Extrano. Extrano is a character who didn't receive the best of treatment in his early years. A DC character, Extrano first appeared in Millennium Issue 2 in 1988 and is a superhero magician, although many might remember him for what he's generally mocked for, a magical gay character who was attacked by an AIDS vampire called Hemogoblin that then made him HIV positive. You can't make this shit up. Needless to say, the portrayal was not a great one, especially for the queer community in a time when there was plenty of misconceptions about AIDS. He was a character who was selected by the Guardians of the Universe to take part in an experiment in human evolution, which made him into a powerful magician, whose sorcery abilities were never really fully elaborated upon. He would dress in loose, colorful garments refer to himself as Auntie, and was pretty much coded as a homosexual character, who later would acquire a powerful skull crystal that made him more masculine, which was largely believed to be the result of negative comments from readers. His magic consisted of stage tricks, using ping pong balls to outwit his foes, he could levitate and fire blasts of energy from his hands, but not much of what he could do was explained in great detail. He was very much the token magician character. Now These days he's gotten a bit more of a makeover, although his abilities are still quite ambiguous. He appeared in DC Rebirth, working with Midnighter to locate Apollo's soul in hell. According to writer Steve Orlando, who himself is bisexual, I quote, With a book like Midnighter and Apollo, which from cover to cover is a love letter to queer characters and our struggle to live, be visible and love, it felt right to return one of the first and reintroduce him to a new generation. Maybe there's... There's hope for Extrano after all. Number two, The Beyonder. For this version, we have to go to yet another one of Marvel's humor issues. These issues have brought us such gems as what if Black Panther was white? Now I give you The Beyonder. Just let the pun wash over you, live in it. Be the pun. This comes to us from the what the question mark exclamation mark, a self parodying comic series for silly jokes. Its tagline was the Marvel Mag of Mirth and Mayhem. The Beyonder is this universe's version of the Beyonder, who gives Spider Ham a version of the black uniform. But it's not a symbiote. I just want to tell you about the Beyonder. It's fun to say for me, but it's probably not fun for you to listen to. Number one, 
Scorn. Scorn first debuted in Carnage number no. 5 in 2011. So Scorn was created out of a piece of Carnage left in space after Carnage was torn in half by the Sentry, but he got better. The Sentry may be one of the most powerful beings out there, but Carnage has plot armor and sells comics, so take that Sentry. The pieces are collected to attempt to create prosthetic limbs, so the first thing that the symbiote bonds to is a prosthetic arm. Because of this, Scorn can bond to technology. Now this is an element that some find confusing, and also there are other story elements that make Scorn a bit convoluted. Things like how Cassidy was alive and had been preserved by Carnage and was repaired by these prosthetics. Again, you can't kill Carnage. Scorn was eventually corrupted by Null, the symbiote god, and started a cult to worship him. She was killed by Carnage after offering herself to him. Absolute Carnage. There is so much carnage going on right now. Number 10. Nazis raise milk prices. This comes to us from 1942, so get ready, full steam propaganda ahead. All the heroes who were around at this time period were fighting Nazis, and Wonder Woman was no exception. But they still wanted there to be comic book plots, like this one from Sensation Comics number 7. In this tale, Diana notices that the price of milk is soaring, and she's on the case. She goes to speak to the head of International Milk Co., but he's dismissive. Long story short, they're secret Nazis, and they're raising the price of milk to make it inaccessible for American youth so that they will have weak, brittle bones and not be able to fight playing the long game. They also try to drown her in milk, but she changes in the milk, escapes, and ultimately ensures the safety of good affordable milk prices. That's the kind of out of the box thinking you could expect from the golden age villains. Kept you on your toes. Number 9. Ra's al Ghul pretends to be Talia to get Bruce Wayne's body. This is going to take us over to Batman Beyond and is largely on here because I want to talk about this show and this fantastic episode. This plot comes to us from the episode Out of the Past and deals with Bruce's sadness about aging and how he feels the best years of his life and his great loves are behind him. When lo and behold, Talia appears, offering him the chance to rejuvenate in the Lazarus Pit, thusly leaving Gotham to Terry and come and finally live their life together. Also, this is all pre damien so she hasn't raped him in this continuity. That's how Damien was conceived. Fast facts. Bruce starts to take her up on it, but as you can imagine, it's too good to be true. And after sharing a kiss, and maybe more, it's revealed that Talia isn't Talia at all. It's Raish, who has overwritten Talia, taking control of her body. This is all part of a long quest because he wants Bruce's body to rejuvenate it, transfer his consciousness into it, and pretend to be his long lost heir, continuing his plans with Bruce Wayne's resources. Here's the thing he didn't have to do this with Bruce. He could have picked any old rich Joe Schmo with no no legitimate errors and tempted them with youth. This was just creepy and leads me to wonder about his true feelings for Bruce. Great episode, good series, watch it, that is all. And look, I didn't go off on my usual DCAU tangent, which this series is a part of. Number 8, we have to take a look at a movie now, we've got Captain America, the really cheesy one from 1990. The movie that gave us a Steve Rogers who steals vans by pretending to be carsick. In this film, the Red Skull is really against the president's pro-environmental campaign and decides that really there's only one thing to do and that's kidnap and brainwash him. This is instead of assassinating him, which was an option. But the kidnap brainwash plan is just so much more fun. The Red Skull needs a challenge. There's also nukes involved, but this brainwashing plot was the crux of it. This plan is weak, and if the Red Skull were real, I'm sure he'd sue for slander, because he'd never come up with such a played out plan. At least not in the 90s. Maybe in the days of the great milk price hike, though. It was a joke, I know they're from different companies. Lower your pitchforks. Number seven, ZZZXX. Yes, I said Zed. It's Canada up here. This is a more recent edition who debuted in X Men Kingbreaker number two in 2009. This symbiote is a Clintar and a mutant, and it eats brains. It was discovered by the Shi'ar. The most interesting thing about this symbiote, aside from its rather random letter centric name, is how it was weaponized against the Charles Xavier from the Cancerverse, which was a realm introduced in the Realm of Kings crossover comic 2010 a universe ruled by evil organic masses. So the Xavier in this universe was a planet-sized brain, and for a brain eater like ZZZXX, a match made in heaven. This could really have hit the zombie element harder with the symbiote, but I mean, they have Marvel zombies for that. Number 6. Scarecrow makes everyone illiterate. So the DCAU, that being the DC animated universe, had a series of tie-in Batman comics, two series actually, and this plot comes from those pages. And it takes the heroes a while to figure out that it's actually a Scarecrow plot, because in all fairness, it doesn't match his usual MO, at least not until you really think about it. 
So in this story, nobody can read anything anymore. They can't read signs, books, nothing. And society just instantly collapses. Train conductors can't run trains, people can't follow road signs, pandemonium. The thing with this plan is that it takes a very loose look at illiteracy. Like people can't understand symbols of any kind or things that were color coded. Nothing. It's just a bit of a stretch. They can't even take money out of an ATM. All they're seeing is bizarre symbols. People are dying. They call it the illiteracy disease. This story was two parts. On the second cover, it has Robin cowering in fear of road signs. The thing with this one is, well, it's just not accurate accurately labeled. It makes for a fun story, but you really have to suspend your disbelief, which I am 100% willing to do. Way to go outside the box, Scarecrow. That's good thinking. And at five, Metamorpho. Metamorpho is a head scratcher. Also known as the Element Man, Metamorpho is a DC character who helped found the Outsiders and first appeared in 1965 in The Brave and the Bold issue 57. He was a product of the popularity of Fantastic Powers, a successor to Doom Patrol and Metal Man. And his abilities consisted of elemental shape shifting, super strength, and invulnerability. While those last two are pretty straightforward, it's the shape shifting that we're concerned with. When you think elemental, you think fire, earth, water, air, right? Well, Metamorpho is more complex than that, which often causes confusion surrounding the character. He can transmute his body into a variety of elemental compounds that he can then form to his will. In other words, he is a much more science based hero. Now, initially, he was restricted to elements that naturally occur within the human body, but over time, that became less and less of a limitation, with writers allowing him to assume forms of gas, liquids, or solid states. He can alter the shapes and consistencies of these elements to form complex compounds and can shape parts and portions of his body rather than being forced to change it in its entirety. He is capable of forming himself into complex structures the likes of tanks and a bicycle, or more ambiguous stuff like a cloud. Number 4. Lex Makes a Robotic Lois Lane So Lex is obsessed with Clark on many levels, some that he probably doesn't want to admit to himself. And he's always scheming something. Remember when Connor Kent aka Connell was Lex and Clark's son before they retconned that? Well I will always remember. The New 52? What's that? So in Action Comics number 890, we learned that Lex's assistant had made a Lois Lane robot, and while well, Lex was like, okay, thanks, I'll keep it. And he did, and he slept with her. It's just weird. This is just bizarre villainous behavior. It happened while plotting, really, but you need to know. I mean, he's creating clones of him and Clark's DNA. He's sleeping with a Lois Lane bot. There are things that need to be discussed here that probably never will be. All I'm gonna say is, Clex. Number three, Spider Man India. So, Spider Man India was a mini series that lasted four issues in between 2004 and 5 and blended elements elements of Spider-Man mythos with more mythological elements. The concept was conceived by an Indian director who had met with Stan Lee to discuss creating an Indian superhero. Symbiotes in this universe are demons, fanged tusked demons who once ruled but were captured in an amulet. When the amulet was found, it turned the host into the Green Goblin. The demon would hop from the Green Goblin to Spider-Man, but be expelled, but before this it is called Venom. The amulet is destroyed, but not Venom. He's always a menace, no matter the earth. Number 2. Magneto was Zorin all along. This arc and the retcon that had to be done afterwards are still confusing to people. So Zorn debuted in the new X-Men Annual number 1, and he existed like he was real, only at some point he was replaced by Magneto, and no one noticed, because Magneto sorta of mimicked the abilities that Zorn had, and he was masked. But then he was unmasked, and haha, with the help of Chinese supporters, it was Magneto the whole time, and he wasn't dead, and he did all this, pretended to be a teacher for months because he wanted to infiltrate the X-Men. So yeah, this was clearly a reveal to be a reveal, and then they had to retcon it away and it doesn't even make sense how they did it. Just why? Unpopular opinion, I think this entire run by Grant Morrison is overrated. Leave your unpopular opinions down below. I can see them now. You're overrated. You move your hands too much. Number one, Big Barda and Superman are kidnapped to make a porno. So for this, we need to go back to Action Comics number 592. And in this story, poor Barda, who is just adjusting to her life on Earth, tries to stop a crime, only to end up in the sewers and kidnapped by a villain called the Sleaze, who lives up to his name and then some. He can control people's emotions and force them to do his bidding. And his plan at first is just to make her dance for him. But by happenstance, Superman ends up tracking Sleaze to the sewers, and then they both end up under his control. And his next plan is to take them to a pornographer to shoot an official porn movie for the money. The worst part, they're both fighting it the entire time, but can't. Thankfully, they're saved by Barda's husband, Mr. Miracle, and all they've done is kiss. Okay, this plan, it makes sense, it's just really gross and icky. It's not even a bad story, it just leaves you feeling like you need several showers. It's a super petty, weak plan. I mean, Sleaze, you were from Apocalypse, and this is the best you got? Actually, I'm kinda glad. If this was the B plan, I don't wanna see the A plan. It's probably, ugh, like a superhero orgy or something. 
In at number 10, Danielle Moonstar. Danielle Moonstar is a confusing character, period. She's an individual who has been through multiple iterations of aliases, to the point where it's almost comical. Danielle Danny Moonstar first appeared in the New Mutants in 1982, and is a Cheyenne superhero who is generally associated with the X-Men. She was initially codenamed Psyche and later became Mirage. And her abilities history is a long one. Let's start with her mutant powers. She was a former empath who lost her abilities to communicate with animals and create three-dimensional images of visual concepts within her mind and the minds of others. Like I said, she lost that. Generally, she could manifest people's fears or desires as realistic illusions. She lost those powers on M Day and then regained them after being infected with the transmute virus, but then was also cured of it by Dark Beast. See what I mean? It's already confusing. She briefly could make telepathic images manifest as psionic energy, allowing them to become tangible entities of solid psionic force, but that was limited. She would carry around a dream spear with her to destroy them when she was done with them. Unfortunately, though, these powers would give her blinding headaches. Then, she became a Valkyrie and was endowed with the Valkyrie power to perceive death. She would lose those powers though when Asgard fell, but then made a deal with Hela to get them back. And in the past, she was capable of manipulating quantum energy. Moving on to number nine, Black Hood. When you hear the name Black Hood, a couple of different things may pop into your mind. For starters, it's a name that likely elicits a pulp character, mysterious and criminal perhaps in nature, a vigilante maybe. Now, for those of you immersed in pop culture sensations, you might think of the CW TV series Riverdale and its mildly absurd Black Hood serial killer storyline. If you don't watch Riverdale, yes, that's a thing. Well, the Black Hood comic character actually has relations to that latter association, since he was a creation of Archie Comics. First appearing in Top Notch Comics issue 9 in 1940, he became rather popular, getting his own title called Black Hood Comics in 1943, which was a pulp magazine that ran for 11 issues before it was retitled and shifted its focus to being an all humor title. During his time under Archie Comics, he was merely a great fighter and detective. But after the character was revived by DC's Impact Comics imprint in 1991, he gained a different set of powers, magically increased physical abilities and awareness. So what does that even mean? Well, we'll get to that in a sec, because here's where it gets even more befuddling. Impact had three Black Hoods. The first was a bitter vigilante who was killed off in their first issue of Black Hood. The second was a high school student who took over the hood but then abandoned it. And then the third was a former mobster who killed the first Black Hood. Whenever somebody wore the hood, they would get heightened awareness and increased strength speed and agility. The real kicker though? The hood was believed to be cursed, with each individual who wore it eventually succumbing to death, and the hood finding its way into the hands of a new individual who had the potential to take up the helm. Moving on to 8, The Thunderer. The Thunderer is a character who was published by Timely Comics in the Golden Age, the predecessor of Marvel. He's a dude whose superpower was high impact voice amplification. In other words, Dude shouted real loud. So let's backtrack here for a sec. Thunderer first appeared in 1941 in Daring Mystery Comics issue 7 and was a fellow named Jerry Carstairs, a radio operator frustrated that the US wasn't dealing with crime or Nazi saboteurs, so he took the law into his own hands. After learning of a Nazi infiltration operation that was abusing the radio station he worked at, he adopted the Thunderer persona, a costume with a built in microphone, and took them down. He is capable of deafening people or leveling buildings with his sonic scream. Sure, Sure, you could call him a predecessor to Black Bolts, perhaps, on a creative level, but let's be real here. How exactly he was able to create a built in microphone to do that in the 40s and level buildings is beyond me. Needless to say, he fell into obscurity, with one of his only claims to fame now being that he appeared in an animated Spider Man series in an episode called Six Forgotten Warriors. At least his costume looked kind of cool, though. You gotta give him that. Number seven, last movie for now, I promise. Then we're on to the full comic book zaniness, but we have to talk about Catwoman, the Halle Berry one. People often get caught up in the Halle Berry as Catwoman or the terrible CG or the costume trying so hard to be sexy it does a 180 and just becomes sad. But what is often skipped over is the plot. So this film involves an evil cosmetics company whose product will eventually destroy the faces of the women who use it, while also hardening them into stone. This is actually a classic storyline, we've been here before. However, when you make it the focal point of a 2004 movie, people start to poke holes in it. Lauren Hadari, played by Sharon Stone, is the wife of the CEO of the beauty company and she just becomes obsessed. She she kills patients, Halle Berry is not playing Selena Kyle in this movie, she kills her own husband and goes to great lengths to keep this a secret. They need to release this product and keep it going. However, here's the thing, this is an untenable plan. People are going to use this product and then the word will get out. Are you going to kill every single person who uses it? No. So essentially the fight is Catwoman trying to stop people from having to file a civil suit, a class action lawsuit actually. This movie is actually really fun if you accept it on its own terms. It's not good, but that doesn't mean you can't have a good time. And it's Kylan. There are plenty 
of animal themed superheroes out there in the world of comics. Generally their powers derive from their animal persona as if they were some sort of anthropomorphic creature who had the abilities of said creature. We're not talking furries here friends. Don't you dare make that joke in the comments. For example, take a look at Beast. Even Wolverine has similarities to his alias's namesake. But then there is Kylun, who is slightly misleading. Sure, he looks like a cat creature of sorts, feline in nature, but that has no relation to his abilities. He's got claws and fangs which he can use in battle, but his true power is something unrelated. He can mimic sounds. Literally any sound that he hears, Kylan aka Colin McKay can replicate it thanks to his super powered vocal cords. You weren't expecting that were you? Number 5. Endo Sim Armor This first debuted in the Superior Iron Man number 1 in 2014. So in 2014 Marvel had an event called Axis, which many do not remember too fondly. Cliff notes, Avengers and X-Men versus the Red Skull controlling Xavier and Onslaught. After all of this, Tony's personality was flipped, so now he was Dark Tony. And so he created the Armor Mark 50, a smart liquid metal mesh incorporating symbiote elements. What could go wrong? Also, I can't hear liquid metal without thinking about Terminator 2. It's actually kind of sad. This was a mindless artificial symbiote that was entirely controlled via artificial intelligence, and then cast aside when Tony's personality flipped back. Superior Iron Man was an interesting time. 100% it just existed because of how well Superior Spider-Man had done. But you know, that one had stakes. Shots fired, I'm sorry. I actually have a soft spot for the aesthetic of this armor. Moving on to number 4, Super Teen. On one of our previous lists we mentioned Pure Heart, the superhero version of Archie's comics namesake Archie Andrews. He is a superhero who is pure of heart if his name didn't give that away. And what exactly he is capable of is questionable at best. As long as he remains pure of heart, he has superpowers. You guys should probably go watch part 3 of this list if you're curious. Now for those of you who already have, at this number we have one of his companions, the superhero version of Betty Cooper, who comes to be when Betty twists her magical ponytail. Actually, her powers are supposed to be similar to Pure Hearts, which, yes, just makes her more confusing. She has been described as a hero who can, I quote, do just about anything with her snappy looking costume and jet belt. So we know she can fly, we know she has super strength, we know that she is super durable, and we know her powers come to be when she witnesses someone's life in danger. For example, Archie about to get hit by a truck. Archie about to fall off a ledge, Archie about to hurt himself in pretty much any way possible because apparently he is super klutzy. Or at least he is when super teens around. But aside from that, she just tends to be a bit vague in her portrayals, hence her inclusion on this list. And just baffling conceptually in general. It's like Archie Comics is like, let's make our, our characters into superheroes. That's a great idea and it just didn't really work out. Number 3. Doctor Doom vs Office Supplies This comic is from 2006 and its full title is Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four in Brain Drain, Teacher's Count slash Office Max Custom Comic Number 1. This comic features Doctor Doom trying to drain the intelligence out of the children of the world. But really what this story is about is being sponsored by Office Max and featuring some actual teachers. This is a PSA comic, so a public service announcement. Its message is that teachers need to be paid more. How it delivers that message, well is, yeah. Basically is trying to talk about how they have to contend with real world issues like having to buy their own office supplies, but then goes, thankfully there's office max so they're super affordable, hint hint. And also they take on ignorance such as Dr. Doom's brain drain machine. This comic does have some stellar moments though, such as the teachers throwing office supplies at Doom, and also Reed being impressed by the Office Max supply store. He's actually like, wow, look at all these supplies, rubber bands and a ball. Reed is impressed by many things, but a ball of rubber bands? Okay, sure Jan. Up next, the two Doorman. Doorman aka Damar Davis is a Marvel character who first appeared in West Coast Avengers Volume 2 issue 46 in 1989, and was a member of the Great Lakes of Avengers. He responded to Mr. Immortal's ad for heroes for the Great Lakes team who, on paper, can generate portals and can fly via skis, which yes is weird. He is intangible and can also bring souls to the afterlife. It's a confusing set of skills, right? But here's where it gets more perplexing. His portal ability has a restriction. He can teleport people through walls, with his body serving as that portal, hence the name Doorman. Concerning the skis, he can summon them at will, although that doesn't make them any less confusing. If anything, his most useful talent is delivering souls to oblivion, but even then he can only do it if that person is deceased, and he becomes only visible to that soul. It's like his creators didn't really think the portal ability was enough, so they decided to use the more mythical version of the doorman or gatekeeper and make him all about death, which for the record was a power of his added after the fact. 